I'll start this timer, make sure it don't go long. Um, well, welcome everyone. It's so, so good to be with you all. I know we got some folks gone on spring break, but y'all are faithful. You're here. So, yes, a few of the proud. So, thank you for um, joining us tonight. And, um, man, what a beautiful time of, um, you know, confessing and singing who God is and being reminded of who He is. And, uh, man, I, I don't know how this came to mind or why exactly, but I was just thinking how, um, you know, often in maybe it's, I don't know if it's a lot of churches, but um, it's, I think it's sort of easy to think, like we come into Christian faith, like, and it's going to be easy, easy to think it's going to be easy, you know, or like, well, it's my life gets better, and which is, I think, in a sense, true, um, in the sense of God heals and restores and does that, but what people often don't tell you is that it's going to be hard as hell um, yeah. in the process, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, the journey itself, it's the, in, the inward journey, the journey of the heart, of the soul, you know, um, I hope saying hell wasn't offensive. I didn't mean it in an offensive way. But, you know, it just, I just it's, it does, it really hurts. And, um, and but, it is, but, it's a, but it's a liberating kind of, um, not the pain itself is liberating, but I mean the, the process itself ultimately is liberating. But, whoo, babies, getting there can be challenging. So anyway, I just say that. It has nothing to do with my message tonight. I just say that as a, just, I don't know, it's for someone. You know, and um, based on your body language, maybe a few someone's. So, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, so before we jump in, I want to give you a soccer update um, for the, the, the team I coach. So we did play yesterday, and we lost 10 to 0. Um, another, another rough one. Um, Y'all, yeah, but I had a, another, of course, there's always some funny moments. So we had, there's one kid I've been working with. You guys will remember him uh, from a few months ago if you were here, because I told a story. He's like, we're teaching him to play defense. And it's his first time, well, I guess three seasons ago was his first time to play soccer. He's still kind of getting the hang of it. So, um, you know, I'm teaching him how to play defense and like, you know, and so that thing I was yelling at, I was like, come on, be, you gotta be aggressive, buddy. Like, don't be afraid, be aggressive. You know, I was really trying to pump him up because he just looked, you know, scared. And so there's this moment where they're charging, like they're, the player's coming right at him. And this is it's the same kid a few months ago. It's like a very similar story. So the, the, the offensive player's coming right at him and I mean, I can see this, you know, from the sideline. Here it comes. And I'm like, I'm like, Xander, all right, go, buddy. Don't be afraid. Go. I'm like, get him. Like, you're the, you know, he's the last line of defense for the goalie. And so it's like this moment of inspiration. Like, you can, you can see the fire in his eyes. And he starts charging. Like, he's running at the guy. I'm like, yes. And he's like, Vroom. and the guy is barreling down on him. And all of a sudden, he gets about five steps from him. And he goes, he stops. And he's like, and he starts backing up and starts literally running away. I was like, Ah, close. It was close. So we're getting there, y'all. We're getting there. Um, so we are, if you, if you are um, just joining us tonight, maybe for the first time, you've come on a good night because we're kicking off a new series, and it's titled Tranquility, um, Cultivating Calm in a Crazy World. And whew, I think we could all use a little bit more of this. So the, the, this series really was inspired um, by a text I sent out maybe a good six weeks ago just to some, some folks kind of in our community um, asking for like feedback on like series and just, hey, what would you guys like to hear and you know, what would be engaging and helpful for you like in your life? And uh, far and away, this was like the topic. This was the thing. It was, it was just, it was the themes of um, anxiety, depression, stress kind of the, was like the unholy trinity that was, I kept hearing. So. Um, so that's what we're going to be kind of diving in over the next five weeks. And um, I think, yeah, it's, it is, it's a really relevant topic um, because anxiety, depression, and all those um, kind of mental, emotional struggles and, and almost just a general kind of unhappiness, it really is quite um, pervasive, you know, in our society, uh, in our world. And so if this is something you struggle with, like you're not alone. Um, there's millions and millions of people who, um, yeah, are really uh, kind of there with you. And honestly, whether or not you have like a diagnosed kind of thing, you know, um, the truth is I think at some level to be human is to struggle with these things. So I think this is a really, um, yeah, just a really relevant series. So our, our kind of guiding text um, for, the, for the, this time will be uh, Ephes or, sorry, Ecclesiastes um, chapter 4, verse 6. And uh, we'll unpack this more later in the message, but it, it says this, Better one handful with tranquility 
than two handfuls with toil and a chasing after the wind. It's uh, some good poetry there. Um, and uh, so what I wanted to, to name and kind of start off with is, is a few kind of, let's define some terms. So by anxiety, uh, I mean kind of a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease. And uh, obviously this can be at sort of the, the sort of light end of the spectrum. That's kind of what I just described. That can of course sort of develop and get much more intense um, all the way into like full blown, you know, um, anxiety attacks and panic attacks and things like that. So um, that's kind of a whole spectrum. And which actually leads me just to name kind of a caveat for this whole series. Um, I won't be saying this every week, but just so everyone is clear, the way I'm thinking of this series is as a supplement um, in your life, um, not necessarily as a like replacement for medication or replacement for um, you know meeting with a therapist or something like that. I think maybe people have this sort of idea of the sacred and the secular, and it's kind of like, oh, okay, well now I'm getting like you know the the sacred, like the true cure and way. This is you know the biblical way. And so now I don't need you know, all that other stuff. And the truth is that sort of divide of sacred secular is just not really true. And I mean, there's no such thing, for example, I don't think as like secular therapy. I mean, wherever two people are seeking the truth, I mean, are you telling me like somehow God's not in that? Like, that doesn't make sense. I think the spirit is there. So um, all to say that there's room for all that. What I'm really trying to get at here um, is kind of to, to give you some talks at the kind of intersection of um, kind of psychology as well as kind of scripture and Christian theology. So I'll be kind of drawing those um, three things in. Um, so that's, okay, so that's the definition of anxiety. De definition of depression. Um, I mean a feeling of prolonged sadness, low energy, uh, and dejection. Um, right, and that can, again, that's sort of a spectrum, that's sort of the light end, that can get all the way into um, like feelings of suicide and um, things like that. So um, yeah, it can get really um, intense. And uh, I think sort of the, the big question is, uh, at least from a cultural perspective, is uh, why, why is this so pervasive you know, in the culture? Um, now, perhaps uh, some folks here think like, well, I mean, this, you know, to be human is to struggle with these things, so it's sort of always been that way. Um, and, uh, nah, nah, no. <laughs> uh, at least just based on some of the research I've done in the last few months, um, this is definitely a thing, and it's kind of, it's getting worse um, in the culture. And so I've been really reflecting on like, what is, you know, what's up? Like, wh why? And I mean, I think, um, you know, honestly, there's a lot of theories out there as to what's going on. I mean, everything from, you know, the foods we eat um, to toxicity in kind of the world, like, you know, just being in a building like this with painted walls and, you know, so toxicity levels. We are, um, you know, exposed to more toxicity than people in past generations and such. So there's that all the way to things like um, social media usage and internet usage and, you know, um, all the things, right? So, um, so there's, yeah, there's lots of kind of theories and, and such out there. Um, but uh, th one kind of, I think, clue to this is um, actually that you might think that if you study like across cultures and countries, because obviously this is like a global thing, that um, kind of the more wealth you have, so to speak, the higher up on the socioeconomic scale you are, that the better off you are like in terms of anxiety, depression, like, you know, you're happy and like life is easier and all that. But what's interesting is that it's inversely related. Uh, there was a fascinating study. This is from, and by the way, this is a little bit nerdy. Don't worry, the whole message won't be this nerdy, but I'm getting a little nerdy here at the beginning just to kind of lay the groundwork. Um, so this is from uh, JAMA uh, uh, Medical Journal. And they uh, basically studied, in 2017, they did a study across like continents and cultures and, and countries and things. And they found that um, they're looking at a percentage of the population that was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder. And here's what they found. In low-income countries, 1.6% um, were diagnosed uh, with this. In middle-income countries, it doubled, right, to, um, or almost doubled, up to 2.8. And then in high-income, it went up to 5%. In other words, what you see is this sort of slope of the, the better off sort of um, financially and socioeconomically you are, the worse your anxiety and depression is getting, which is sort of mind-bending in a way, right? And it's not to say um, 
that, well, again, you can see by the statistics, it's not as though it's non-existent in other countries or something. It's just, it's just much lower. Uh, and so this has puzzled, you know, researchers, and it's sort of led to all the questions of like, why, you know, why is this and what's going on and um, all those kinds of questions. And, uh, and like I mentioned, there's a lot of kind of theories out there as to why, uh, but the most helpful kind of researcher um, that I've come across is a Christian psychologist. His name is Dr. Archibald um, Hart. And uh, he has written, he's, um, he's a board certified psychologist, dean of the Department of Psychology at Fuller Theological Seminary in California. Uh, and he's written dozens of books on mental health and such. And uh, he gave kind of a, a diagnosis of this. And the reason I like his insight is that I think it sort of captures, it's almost like the thing behind the thing, so to speak. Like it sort of explains, um, well, yeah, it just it explains a lot. So now his sort of theory is quite complex. Uh, so I don't know if you'll be able to quite track it, but I'll go ahead and read a really in-depth quote from him. Uh, and this is what he says. Uh, it's the stress, dummy. That's his quote. You know. Um, and... <laughs> This, I think, is honestly, it's quite accurate. This, and it makes, it makes sense of a lot of things, um, partly because it makes sense of the whole um, poor versus wealthier countries. Now you say, well, wait a second, it's pretty stressful to live in poverty and such, which is true. This is where you get into the difference, though, between acute stress and chronic stress. So acute would be like a moment, a, a terrible day, a terrible week, a, even a bad month. Um, where something, you know, you have a catastrophe, someone you love passes away or, you know, something like that. And it's just, it's traumatic and it's like, oh my God. And you kind of have to work through it. Now that's acute stress. And of course, um, this, that's all people in the whole world deal with that kind of thing, right? Bad things happen to humans and we have stress. Um, now chronic stress is this sort of low line, perpetual, um, almost a state of emergency that your body keeps getting sent into like 50, 100, 150, 200 times a day. If you've ever had a moment where your heart just starts right? And your hands get cold, maybe from public speaking as mine are right now. Um, if you notice every time I greet y'all, I'm like the worst person to shake hands out there because it's like, oh my God, dude, are you dead? Like my hands are so cold, you know? And it's partly because I'm getting ready to be up here. Right? And, and this is what happens. Right? We have stress, the, the, the blood flows, it leaves your fingers and your toes, and it goes to your vital organs because your body thinks, oh my God, we're dying. Like Terrible things are happening to us. And so it's, right, it's trying to protect us, which is, kind of points out that stress isn't necessarily bad and, or stress response. That isn't bad. Like Your body's trying to take care of itself. But if you have that kind of thing, day after day after day after day after day. And so it's the boss yelling at you. It's the um, deadlines you feel like you can't meet. It's the constant ding, 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 ding on your cell phone. These are, oh my God, these are like, well, I'm going to say it again, little gifts from hell. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the, geez, the, the, it, and it, what happens, right? It's this sort of chronic, again, it's not the end of the world, but it's this sort of low line chronic stress. Um, this explains the difference in between the poor and wealthier countries. Um, this explains the difference um, between, for example, men and women. Uh, females are, I think it's twice as likely to experience an anxiety disorder. And some of the theorizing there is that uh, ladies have entered the workforce and are now carrying both the demands of outside, like all the job stuff, and then come home and carry not ex not all of it, but the the sort of lion's share of home duties. They're carrying a lot of stress, right? And this is why they tend to be, um, yeah, have higher levels of anxiety. Um, and it also kind of explains why um, life today, as opposed to a hundred or a thousand years ago. Um, why it's, this has become so kind of ubiquitous and just pervasive in the culture now as opposed to then. And again, it's back to the whole acute versus chronic. So back in the day, of course, people experienced terrible things. But, but in their days, right, it would be a bad day or a bad hour, and then they were living at camel speed, right? It's like the world was just slower. And so they had a lot of downtime. Like you think of even travel back in the day, like you're like, we're gonna, you know, go across America or we're gonna even, you know, travel 30 miles. And it was like, well, that's gonna be our, you know, even 30 miles would be like our whole day. And what are you gonna do? Well, we're gonna walk. 
the whole day, and that's what we're, right? And you're just sort of chill. It's like everything, it was just slower. And I think this starts to name exactly what's going on in our world. Because A, it's the pace, right? It's not just the hours we work. People 100 years ago worked a lot of hours. But then guess what? When they went home, they went to sleep because it was dark. And there's no electricity. It's like, what are you going to do? You're going to sit around the fire for a while, you know? And uh, well, all right, I guess we'll go to bed and nothing to do, right? Even the idea of boredom. I mean, today, isn't it? It's almost a luxury. Like, if you're bored, that's like, whoa, I haven't been bored in a few years. Like, this is strange, right? Because there's always simulation. There's always kind of things going on. And um, what Hart, uh, in his work, what he points out is even our so-called downtime isn't. Because now you say, well, I'm not at work. But it's like, but for your brain, you're going going, 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 right? It's this constant simulation. I had this um, hilarious moment the other night where I was going to uh, hang out with my, my brother-in-law, Josh, and uh, we were going to watch a movie. And I guess he can chill these kind of movies. I could not because we were watching, uh, I don't remember what it was called, Aletia or, I don't know, it was some like kind of sci-fi movie. And it was, uh, I mean, it was intense, right? And so it's like 10 o'clock at night, probably when I should have been winding down, but the music is like, you know, it's just crazy. And she's like flying around and these like terrible monsters like trying to cut her in half. I'm like, oh my God. Right? And it's, so what happens? Our downtime, I mean, my brain is like, I mean, my, I could feel my heart like beating, you know, like, and that's the point, right? And we call it, it's entertaining. I mean, I was definitely glued to the screen, like, oh my God, is she going to die? But what's happening? Like, is this a good recipe for sleep that night? No. Right, because even our so-called downtime often becomes not, and it's like we're always on, we're always going. Um, here's, this is the more in-depth quote from Dr. Archibald Hart. He puts it this way. He says, too much stress or stress that hangs around too long raises the level of cortisol uh, being released from the adrenal glands. This increased cortisol finds its way to the brain and blocks the natural tranquilizers from reaching their receptor sites. In other words, the more kind of stress you're experiencing, the more adrenaline, the more cortisol that's released into your body, it binds to the sites in your brain, which then prevents the happy chemicals in your brain from binding, which is why you start to experience a sort of low level all the time, day in, day out, because there's, it's, and either it can kind of manifest as anxiety or depression or both. Often people struggle with both. Uh, and this is, um, yeah, what's happening to us. And um, I wish I could say I was going to preach this whole series um, as, you know, someone who, like, y'all, 10 years ago, that used to be me. But today, I stand before you, you know, I don't know, whatever, uh, conquering here or something. The truth is, I suck at all of this. Uh, I am the worst. My, the, the mantra that Maggie's constantly telling me is, Brett, chill out. And I'm so, I am, I'm so bad at it. In fact, we just had um, a, guy's, uh, a guy's trip. I had a vacation a week ago. And I went into that vacation, and I needed like 24 hours just to calm down and recover. Because I was so stinking stressed out. I just, I'm, I, yeah, I was uh, a total mess. And, uh, and it was funny because I was preparing for the series, so I'm reading books and things all on stress and anxiety. I'm like, oh my God, I'm the worst at this. And, um, and I realized what had happened, at least in my own life, was I had developed routines um, even spiritual practices to help me um, cope with what was really an unhealthy level of stress in my life. Uh, and it was kind of, I mean, it's, yeah, it's sort of odd. Like those who know me well, I jump in my pool every morning through the winter. Um, as I know, it sounds crazy. But I do this because it, uh, it helps uh, depression and anxiety. And uh, so I do that. And then I practice like meditative forms of prayer, like prayers of silence. And I'll do this for quite a while each morning. And, um, but I realized I was starting to do these things um, 
as ways yeah, of coping with my crazy instead of from a place of strength, which is I'm already calm, I'm already tranquil, I'm already well, uh, I already am in a place of trusting God, and then I'm going to engage practices, and then I'm going to pray, and, right? In other words, I'm sort of like, like memorizing scriptures and you know, saying prayers, like in this sort of, because I'm like slightly melting down, um, and that's, that's not good. I had, and, and what's interesting, like, um, I'll be okay, you know, during the days where this starts to come out um, is often in the evenings or when something goes terribly wrong. Uh, like I had a moment uh, two weeks ago where, so uh, for those of you who know my schedule, um, you know, I do the table part-time and then I work a part-time job. So I was going there and I work Mondays, Thursdays at my other job. And so that means kind of writing my sermons and things like that. It's sort of in the mornings often kind of early and it's kind of, you know, it can be a little bit hurried and things like that. So I, this was two weeks ago and I was like rushing. I was going and writing and all that. And so I come into Thursday, which is when I need to be wrapping things up. And I come into Thursday and I have like 45 minutes. I literally have a timer. Like I set my timer to go off to tell me when to leave for my other job. You know, so I'm like, okay, 45 minutes, wrap this up. And I open my laptop and my sermon is gone. And I lost it. <laughs> I was like, man, you can tell you. It was so bad, y'all. I was like, oh, my God. I was like, literally, probably, I'm just, I'm cursing a lot in this message. I don't mean to. I'm not usually a cursor. But in this moment, I was like, shit was the best thing I said. I mean, I was just like, what? Like, no. And here's the crazy, this is what was so crazy making. I knew that I saved it. I knew it. I knew that I saved that file. I, I mean, it was, oh God. It was, it was real bad. Caleb's like, it was bad. It was bad. Um, three hours later, I found it, um, which was nice. But this, right, this shows me, um, this shows me that, maybe think of a good analogy is like a car. If you've ever, you know, um, most of you probably, you're, you're adults, you've probably, you know, ridden, at least r ridden in a car. <laughs> and you can see, right, there's the, um, the engine and there's the red, right, the red part. And it's sort of white because it says that, the, right, as you push that gas, it goes, and then before it shifts, right, and you don't want it, you don't want it to get into red. Red is bad. And here's my problem. Maybe some of you can relate to this. I live not in red because, you know, I'm not a sinner. I just... <laughs> I live just as close off of red as humanly possible, right? Just off it, which works fantastic. I mean, I get a lot done. I move things forward until my sermon gets deleted. And then, and I'm just, oh, my God. It's, oh, my, I'm a mess. What kind of a message is this? I don't know what this sermon is. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the, you're like, where's the Bible in this? It's in there. It's coming. We're getting back to this. Um, so let me, let, me, let me capture all this hot mess of a message in this phrase. My friends, God has not called me, he has not called you to live a life of stress and burnout in the name of giving him glory. Uh, that would be the religious version. Now, maybe some of you are like, what? Giving him glory? I don't do that. Okay. Or in the name of being a great success, or in the name of pleasing your parents, uh, in the name of um, proving that you're really a somebody, you know, that you have value in this world. <laughs> like, God, stop. God has not called me, He has not called you to insanity in constant chronic stress uh, in the name of those things. And it's crazy because we come here and we sing the songs. It's like, yes, the Lord, he loves us. Oh, how he loves you, know, just as I am. I don't have to do anything. You know, and then I walk out the doors Monday, and it's like, i got to prove myself, you know. <laughs> and we, we live in these insane ways. Um, I, I was just having a conversation with a friend even before this, this uh, message tonight where we were talking about um, she's balancing work in school and trying to find kind of that path. And it's crazy because, you know, we're all sort of constantly comparing and judging. And, you know, we want to be the people that can handle it all. You know, we don't want to be the person who's like, yeah, that was just too much for me. I couldn't really, I couldn't really do that. Like, who wants to say that? 
right? We want to prove we can do it all. And in the, in the process, we're, we're redlining in our lives. Um, which brings us all the way back to Ecclesiastes. What does this mean? Better one handful with tranquility than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. Uh, we are a two handful people. I am a two handful person <laughs> of I want, I want it all. And I want to believe I can do it all, right? And what is the two handfuls? It's different for everyone, right? It's because, I don't know, whatever the thing driving you is, that fear of not being enough, and so it's two handfuls. It's that, um, just that desire to be awesome, two handfuls. It's that wanting that promotion or the bigger house or the nicer neighborhood or the, you know, whatever things, comparing ourselves to others, and it's just that, it's that grasping. I love how Ecclesiastes describes it as a chasing after the wind. You know what that, I mean, imagine you walk out tonight and someone is running down the street and they're just Right? You'd be like, what is going on? They're probably stressed out. Right? Um, and what, what is that a picture of? It's futility. Right? It's grasping at nothing. Like, oh, I can't get. Right? And this is, I think, like, it sort of begs the question, you know, when will it be enough? All the crazy. When, when will you say, now I've arrived. If I, I did it. <laughs> now, now it's enough. Now, the, now they love me. Now I know they love me. And so I can rest easy. You know, like, you know, um, spoiler alert, it's not, it's not coming. Uh, and so we, we have to start to draw those boundaries. We have to start to do the inner work. This is sort of back to the beginning of my message about the, the inner work so that we can be well. We can be okay with who we are, with the life God has given us. It doesn't mean you can't have goals or, you know, like I'm not saying, you know, just chill out and do nothing, right? It doesn't, but, it, but it's the sense of, um, but we've got to be realistic. We're human beings. I'm just a human being. I'm not a robot. Can't work 24-7. Like I, I just get sleepy, right? And this is, we are humans. We, I think we've got to start embracing um, that. So in this series, um, we're going to be covering a lot of topics. We'll be talking about how to set healthy boundaries, i.e. how to say no. That's hard. Uh, how to live more in the present, right? Just being tuned in to this present moment because we live so often either in the past or the future, anywhere but here, um, and not tuned in to what's going on, the people around us, even our bodies, you know, how we feel and how we're doing like, how are you doing? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Haven't really tuned into that in a year. Um, uh, breaking the worry habit, transforming our thinking. I just think these are all kind of biblical themes. These are all things I think that God um, is really interested in doing a work in our hearts and minds. So anyway, uh, that's kind of where we're headed in the coming weeks. And so I uh, hope you'll join us and enjoy it and learn um, with me, alongside me, and us together on um, how to be a more faithful um, people who can love Christ and live well, not crazy. Amen? Cool. All right, y'all bow your heads, close your eyes. Let me go ahead and um, pray for us. Uh, Lord Jesus, we, um, we bring you just all of our um, hot mess, and uh, just our living can be so... Um, just, just too crazy, and God, I, I want us as a community, and I realize it has to start with me, um, God, I want us to be a tranquil people, I want us to be calm, I want us to be centered, uh, centered on you, tuned into you and ourselves and others, and so God, do that kind of work in us uh, in the coming weeks, and may it be a deep work, uh, and we thank you for doing it. Even when we kick and scream and say, never mind, we take it all back, don't, don't listen to us then. Listen to us now when we're sane, when we're in our right minds. And I pray over every person struggling with, with just deep anxiety, depression, stress. God, would you bring them relief? Would you bring them calm? Would they know that they're loved, that they're enough? And may they live from a healthier place. It is in the life-changing name of Jesus that I pray.